Good morning. Um, <coughs> thank you for getting up there and joining us. Okay, so uh, we haven't got a lot of time. Uh, it's one of the shorter sessions, this is kind of to get you going for the uh, rest of the day. So I'm going to go straight into uh, asking questions of the panel. And what I'll do is I'll introduce each person as I, as I get to them, so rather than doing the, um, you know, the thing that I'm not doing. Uh, so, Tom, if that's okay with everybody. Yeah. So, so um, Tom, I thought I might start with you. Uh, the session is on helmets and cycling and safety. Um, you and Leslie have both written articles on the fact that they uh, perhaps don't make any difference. Um, Tom is a uh, um, uh, uh, blog writer with The uh, Telegraph and uh, normally writes on science, so he's written some quite uh, interesting things on the science and statistics of science. Um, so perhaps you can kick us off with the, the helmet issue and why, oh, okay. why you disagree with Bradley Wiggins, I should say, <laughs> the title yeah. of your article. We're all Brad. Um, yeah. I suppose yeah, the, the, the evidence, as far as I know, over, the, over whether or not cycle helmets prevent death from injury for cyclists is, is incredibly complicated. It's really not clear. There's, there's a, if you get into this really difficult conversation about things like risk compensation, whether or not if you wear, wear a helmet, you're more likely to behave dangerously, whether cars are more likely to drive close to you, and all this sort of stuff. But I th actually think it's, it's, that's asking the wrong question, really. Um, the question is not whether or not a, someone, a cyclist wearing a uh, cycle helmet is more likely to die, but the question is whether if we force cyclists to wear cycle helmets, the overall, it will actually be good for public health in general. And I think you can answer that much more simply. Um, with, there's a, essentially, it, there's been quite a lot of, this, as complicated as it is talking about the evidence for whether or not cycle helmets did protect individuals, the evidence for whether or not forcing people to wear cycle helmets is bad for public health is far clearer because it just it means immediately that fewer people will cycle. And, uh, as soon, as soon as that happens, it means that there's a brilliant piece of evidence by a guy called David Spiegelhalter, who's the um, Winton Professor of Understanding of Risk at Cambridge University, and he says, simple, simply speaking, put, put simply, every hour of cycling by an averagely fit person adds about an hour to your life, statistically speaking. Um, your risk of dying it knocks just minutes off, off that, so basically cycling is really good for you. <laughs> no, that's, uh, that sounds rather... So simplistic, but um, so you should never get off a bike. Should, yeah, if you cycle forever, you will live forever. Uh, <laughs> obviously, that's slightly overstating the case, but um, for, an, yeah, for an average fit person. So, but if you force people to wear helmets, then suddenly lots and lots of people stop cycling. And as soon as you do that, then the public immediately impacts terribly on public health. So, while the evidence for whether or not we should uh, where cycle helmets is complicated, and I'm actually um, I'm not particularly keen on uh, getting into that. I think the, the important thing, the evidence from every single country that's ever tried to force people to, to wear cycle helmets, is that it stops people from, wear, from cycling, and then, on average, your population will die younger. So that's why it's important that we let people. And it should, it should, should, should be, people should be free to choose anyway, especially when evidence is bad. But even if even if we're not worried about that, we're worried just about the public health aspect. The point is, cycle, forcing people to wear cycle helmets paradoxically makes them die younger. And so, just to, to, to emphasise that point, why are you saying that people cycle less? Uh, because it's, it's, it's quite a lot that we kids who don't think it's cool. I know it's that, it's that lame that kids actually will refuse to cycle because they think they look stupid. And, uh, <laughs> and, and it also, you know, slightly less ridiculously, people will find them uncomfortable, they're sweaty, um, and, and unpleasant. I, I, for the record, I wear one religiously every time I get on my bike. And, feel really uncomfortable when I haven't got one and slightly, and slightly worried that I'm going to have my head crushed like an egg. But the, the point is, it doesn't matter what I feel like when I'm doing it, the point is if you try and make everyone wear them, more people will die young. And also, just on a slightly separate note, more cyclists, other cyclists will probably die as well because one of the great things we've known about, um, about cycling is there are safety in numbers. The more cyclists there are in a city, the less likely any individual cyclist among them is to die because the drivers of other vehicles are more aware of cyclists generally. Or can't get past them. Well, yes, there's also that. So, yeah, screw it. Sure. Some people would say. <laughs> so, we'll come on to that, hopefully. Okay, great. Thanks for, to, for kicking us off. Leslie, do you mind if I come to you next? Leslie is the, um, or has been, uh, she's, she's, at the moment, she's a broadcaster and um, uh, her programmes have been on BBC Two Channel 4, Radio 4, uh, BBC Radio Scotland. She has been assistant editor of The Scotsman. Um, she's written a number of articles on cycling, um, which I'm uh, very grateful for her. She's travelled further, so perhaps we should. Started with you. 
But um, you have also written explicitly an article on, on this. <coughs> why uh, compulsory cycle helmets don't make bikers safer? Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps the biggest kind of input from my point of view is that um, I'm also director of a policy group called Nordic Horizons, which uh, takes Nordic subject specialists over from the various Nordic countries <coughs> uh, to the Scottish Parliament, uh, where there's quite a frisky debate going on about our entire future at the moment, um, to consider if there's better ways around our country, actually, than we do. Um, and we've had, the, the inputs we've had, particularly from Copenhagen, have been quite fascinating. Um, I don't know, how many folk have been to Copenhagen? Go, it's great. <laughs> um, but when you start to look, I mean, Amsterdam is very regularly quoted as the kind of surface nirvana. Copenhagen's interesting as well. Um, like all the Nordics, they're very good at collecting statistics. And really, what you begin to realise is um, that safety is a thing that is built into roads. It's built into society. Um, it seems to me it's typical of the way that Britain has become a very atomised individual society, that the onus is put on the individual to protect themselves against the impossible. I mean, you know, we had that in the Olympics where at the same time as you know, cyclists were winning gold medals, actually outside the stadium, cyclists were being killed by buses. Um, what happened in Copenhagen is 30 years ago, they were just as congested as everyone else. In the 1970s, the oil crisis struck. Uh, Denmark had no indigenous energy supplies, and they decided to keep the price of oil, petrol, and cars high to try and encourage a switch, a conscious switch. That's the same time they went into wind turbines and so on. Um, so they had to think about how to make this happen. And what they did was they come up with a Copenhagen lane. And this is a network of lanes which are separated from both the road and the pavement, so that cyclists have a dedicated bit that they go in. Um, they have constantly reinvented that. Uh, they have a system of social accounting as a city where the council comes to the public and says, we want you to do this. What do we need to do to make you do that? And then people will come back and say what they think. And what they generally think is they want more Copenhagen lanes. Um, if you go to Copenhagen or Amsterdam, you will not see a cycle helmet because people feel safe. Statistically, they are safe. And what, what gets me about this entire argument, and I'll quite grant you, the guy that came over from Copenhagen to speak in the Scottish Parliament wouldn't cycle at Edinburgh because he didn't feel safe, even with a cycle helmet. And that's the point, even with a cycle helmet. The cycle helmet's neither here nor there. We are leaving people to sink or swim in melees of traffic, which other countries, which take more of a structural approach to how you build in safety, wouldn't leave people to cope with on their own. So that's the main thing, I think. Um, the other survey that they found is when they ask people, and they do ask a lot of questions of the public, uh, they find that 80% of Copenhageners cycle all year round, 70% of them wouldn't cycle, 70% if they were made to wear a cycle helmet, um, there's strict liability laws, which again is controversial perhaps, but it makes a presumption that, that cars are in the wrong if there's an accident. Um, and generally speaking, it all works pretty well because people are very often both car drivers and cyclists. 57% of people either cycle to work or to school. Now, if that ain't to kind of die for, I don't know what is. Um, but certainly, the emphasis we have, which is always about what are you going to do, what is your individual responsibility, seems to me to be a chronic evasion of uh, how you build in a safe society for cyclists. Okay, so that's, um, that's uh, very useful, thank you. So there's some interesting uh, points there about individual responsibility, which in a moment I think I might put to Josie. Um, but before I do, uh, Matt. Um, there's uh, a, a couple of ideas in there about um, the number of deaths on the street. There's an interesting uh, blog in the US uh, around um, uh, just generally around the street and cycling and uh, stuff in, uh, in New York that often uses the word carnage on the streets. Mm. Um, there's an idea which I'm sure is present in the room of the, a kind of war between uh, road users, uh, you know, between uh, drivers and cyclists. I wondered in your capacity as a uh, owner of a cafe that's frequented by lots of uh, uh, look mum no hands, I don't know if people know it, Matt Corn, it's an excellent, uh, excellent cafe. Um, Matt's uh, started up and it's got kind of a major cycling thing with a cycle shop and uh, uh, all that kind of thing. So in, in your capacity 
I assume you're meeting lots of cyclists all the time. Um, any comments on that aspect of it? Yeah. <coughs> well, I don't like to think of uh, carnage and drivers versus cyclists. I think, you know, there are good drivers and bad drivers and good cyclists and bad cyclists. But, uh, and I found, um, uh, chatting to a few customers about this when I knew that I was coming, uh, I found the views to be just as varied amongst our customers as they are on the internet. Um, it struck me that the, the cyclists who were perhaps the least experienced or our non-cycling customers tended to favour um, uh, bike lanes, uh, perhaps a few compulsory helmet wearing, but uh, the, more, sort of the more experienced the cyclists, the more there was a feeling that the roads should, are, just, are for cyclists as much as anyone else, but that it's the roads that should be made safer and the driving. And uh, rather than putting the onus, onus on cyclists to make themselves safe, their um, time should be spent not talking about helmets, etc., but um, reducing speed limits, uh, making junctions safer, um, sorting out potholes, things like that. Um, yeah, I think carnage is a bit strong. It's certainly, I, no, I think cycling, kind of optimistically, I think cycling has been getting better, mm. um, largely because of the increased numbers of cyclists on the roads and uh, you're quite right that if we make helmets compulsory it's going to be disaster. I think Australia was a 40% drop off. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 I mean, I don't know what would happen to, I wear a helmet all the time, but apart from if I need to get somewhere at short notice and I jump on a forest bike and I've got a helmet, how's that going to work? Um, Carnage is a bit strong, but it could certainly be better. Right. Jump in. Okay. Yeah. Just really quickly. Okay, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll come back round again. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. The, the idea of this, which we're, people are really keen to talk, always talk about how dangerous it is, but I think that's the, the risk of cycling is massively <laughs> overstated. You can't find it a terrible way. It's actually, you've got to cycle for several lifetimes before your risk mm. of dying reaches you know, above 50 50. Mm. It's, it's really safe and good for you. Mm. But just, I think we yeah. should say that more. So well, on, on this website, they talk about car they, they have a, a thing called the weekly carnage roundup, and uh, the phrase they use is the week. Uh, no, the weekly carnage is the report, and they call it a roundup of vehicle violence. <laughs> and uh, also, it gives you an idea of the sort of the time. So Josie, uh, Josie uh, founded the Manifesto Club. Um, <clears throat> she um, uh, run campaigns um, around uh, um, vetting uh, on the spot fines, particularly interested in uh, issues of uh, public space and civic uh, responsibility. Any <coughs> thoughts on this, particularly this uh, issue of the individual responsibility? And the versus... proud recipient of an on the spot fine for cycling through red light. Oh, ah, yeah. <laughs> that should be my fine. No, I mean, I think um, helmets do lead to a, a drop in cycling. I think inconvenience is one of the large reasons for that. I think in Australia, um, where they had a cycle rental scheme, essentially it means you can't just jump on a bike. And I think that that's the main advantage of a bike, more than perhaps it would take an hour off your life or whatever. I mean, actually, just within a, a city, it's, it's the quickest way of getting around in short distance. And it, you're completely independent. You know, you just pick it up, put it down. Um, I think that that's the advantage of cycling from an individual point of view. And I think the trouble with when we look at cycling, is it's always from uh, external points of view, so it's you know, environmental impact and your health and all these kind of statistical things, um, which don't really measure up the, the experience or, 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 or why people do it or, or don't do it when they have things imposed on them. I mean, I um, also wear wear a war helmet, but as a uh, you know, almost like as a charm mm. to, to ward off harm rather than I don't know if it made any difference. Um, but, uh, you know, as essentially that should be an individual choice and if you jump on a bike it's, it's, really, not, it's really not convenient. So I think that, that the, the, the kind of problems with cy cycling now are, I think, to do with the way in which um, this is actually something encouraged by cyclists themselves and kind the of die-ins and everything like that. You know, the kind of exaggeration, as you say, of the, the risk of, of cycling um, and cycling preventing, presenting themselves, cyclists presenting themselves as, you know, as the, the victims of the road. And, and as a result, they think if they wear enough day glow, then they can do what they like, which is not really true. Um, so I think that there is a kind of, um, there's definitely more of a conflict between cyclists and, other, and cars and pedestrians than cars and pedestrians. I think that there is a conflict between cyclists and all other road users. I think it's interesting why that would be. Um, you think I, there is a conflict? 
I, yeah, yeah. I mean, you don't see cars and pedestrians screaming at each other and hitting mm -hmm. cars, do you? Mm -hmm. I mean, well, not not as much. I mean, sorry, I thought you meant there was some kind of fundamental conflict. In I think it's a conflict of interest. Did you mean roads themselves or something? No, no, sorry, not, I see what not, you mean. not really. I think it's more to do, to do with the role that cycling has come to play and the way that cycling has been moralised as a virtuous form of transport um, and, a, as, and, a, as at, and a cyclist has at risk individuals on the road. Um, so I think that that's changed people's behaviour. It's probably made cyclists a little bit annoying um, sometimes. Um, Can't imagine that. <laughs> um, but I think that there, in a way, we want to get back, for me, I'd want to get back to it just being a method of transport and actually the freest, most individual, low-tech, <coughs> independent form of getting around the major city. Um, I very much agree about the structural solu solutions. I think that you know, to, make, to try and make the streets actually um, better for cyclists is far better than the moralising it and saying if you, you have to wear this, wear fluorescence and, and everything. Um, but I think that almost we want to demoralise the whole question of cycling and just see it as a method of transport. I think that would remove a lot of the conflict um, because pedestrians and cars aren't moralised in the same, the same way and you don't have, you just people negotiate the space. Yeah. And sometimes they shout, but not really. It doesn't have the same kind of, um, kind of class conflict yeah. element that cyclists mm -hmm. have, I think. Um, okay, thank you. So, um, Ed, perhaps we can come to you. And, um, <coughs> Maybe this health question uh, that was touched on a bit by um, Tom, adding uh, our life can be uh, lengthened indefinitely by having on a bike. <laughs> and Josie touched on the moralisation of it there. Um, Ed, is uh, you handle communications between schools and uh, debating matters. Yeah. And he's also a keen triathlete. He has been described when wearing his triathlete suit, which he threatened to wear this morning, as uh, looking like a Renaissance statue. <laughs> um, that was actually uh, him who described himself. Yeah. Uh, so obviously, the health issue, something you can really comment on, I would imagine. Brilliant. <laughs> okay. um, so uh, cy cycling is good for you and it, it, and it makes you fit, and uh, I cycle a reasonable amount, and it, it keeps me fit, but it's far from the reason that I cycle, and I feel as though Aside from the moralisation, treating cycling as a panacea for health problems is unconstructive and I also think that cycling, for the sole reason of health, uh, takes the joy out of it, to be honest. If you're on your bike for an hour a day, then you're timing yourself by kind of the miles that you're travelling, the speed and the calories that you're burning. I think there's so much more to cycling than, uh, than the health issue. I think that if you are cycling for to, to, to become healthy, then uh, you won't enjoy cycling particularly much. I think there's a lot more to be, to be gained from cycling than just uh, having it as a, as a health uh, uh, fan. And I think the faddishness of, of, of cycling as a health solution is exemplified in the increasing uh, prevalence of spin classes. I think spin classes after cycling, what boxer size is to boxing. It's the, it, it's the kind of uncompetitive, joyless, static, <laughs> sitting in a room with blaring noise at you, uh, and, and, it, and it's fairly joyless. Uh, so, so, though I think that it's a fantastic thing, cycling does keep you uh, healthy, I think that uh, it, it should not be the primary reason why anybody cycles. Um, can I possibly comment on, on kind of uh, the public, public space issue? Because I think that talking of this kind of conflict between road users and uh, the conflict between cars and cyclists, I think, is it a, is a, is a uh, and, and the extent to which there is significant conflict in roads, I think, is overstated and blown out of proportion by social media and news outlets, which scare off people from cycling, which is a real shame by um, blowing out of proportion the, the prevalence of conflict. But the extent to which there is conflict on the road, I think, is because that we no longer see roads as public space. If you Google image public space, you will see images of parks and occasionally a town square. No one really sees roads as being a public space, a place where people negotiate the rules and interactions between the, di the different users of that space. And I think that that's a real shame. When there is conflict on the road, it's because a cyclist believes that they are wholly in the right, they are playing within the rules, and drivers believe that they are playing within the rules. That's, a, unfortunately, I, I believe that that's uh, a misunderstanding of the way that public space should be, should be seen. I think that if there was more of a negotiation between what is right to do in any given circumstance, 
and less an understanding of who is absolutely right and who is absolutely wrong in absolute terms uh, would lead to uh, a more harmonious relationship between the users of that public space. Okay, so that's, um, <clears throat> that's interesting. It sounds, um, is, is that different, Tom and Leslie, to what, to what you're saying about um, uh, you know, fixing the potholes and uh, having a, a coherent sort of city or maybe nation, basically, you're going to have a big plan in Scotland for cycling? Uh, uh, you know, much more kind of top-down, uh, organised, change the street furniture kind of approach. Well, we're not getting very far with it, to be honest. I mean, that you know, this is this is a struggle for everybody to try and you know, at the moment, there's, there there is a kind of compulsory helmet brigade on. Um, there is a but bear in mind that this fits into a health and safety culture that is infantilising us in every other respect as well. You know, kids can't touch animals in petting zoos. You can't play conkers in case one spins off and blinds you. You know, the list goes on and on and on. So within that, there is this if something might possibly happen, there's an inability to quantify the risk, set it against the other risks that Tom skillfully outlined, and conclude that actually it's nail biggie. Um, so since so we can't do that in any other walk of life, it's no surprise we can't do it in this. But you're absolutely right, and I did a thing, I'm, you know, I am no lean, mean fighting machine. I'm a kind of older gal who likes pegging along and has to get off sometimes. I don't wear a lycra, I don't arm up. I don't want to go faster, you know, I am just going along on the bike. And uh, I did a radio series for uh, Radio Scotland, cycling up the Western Isles, which is great. One of you want to do that, you may need to get off a wee bit. But um, it's a fantastic way to spend a week or two weeks, depending on how fit you are. And um, it's also a great way to meet people, because you just keep encountering life. You're not insulated from it. You go at the same speed, roughly, as it. And you need things, you need a public domain. And actually, that's quite a jolly thing because otherwise one can be very over-insulated in life. So my whole thing really is about connection, I like it. And um, that's another reason I don't really like helmets very much because they make me feel like a kind of ant. <laughs> so the road is a public space, you, you, you kind of like that idea. That yes, and I mean, we just interactions paradoxically with, with all of this, I can see, when, when I, I was cycling in Copenhagen, wasn't quite sure where I was going. There are so many people in the Copenhagen lanes that actually it was 20 minutes before I could stop to realise that I was lost. I have never in my life used the slowing down signal thing on stop cycling proficiency. I was trying to remember what it was because I couldn't stop. Um, now I know London's got, you know, rush hour London traffic must be very similar. And there's a bit of me goes, you know, I don't really want this. But I'd rather have that than, than people not cycling. And that's what it comes down to. It's all the question of making those choices. I can still head out in Scotland, get free cycling. You know, I can put up with a bit of being curried in within cities. I take both your points about you shouldn't that you should treat cycling as a, something that's fun and convenient rather than, as I was in my slightly nerdy way, did talk about public health and, <laughs> and, and sort of numbers and stats. And you're right, of course. I mean, you, when you cycle in London, you get to know London as a city rather than as sort of a series of points on an electrical diagram like you do on the tube. And, and yes, it is convenient, you can leap on it and all these things. And, and yes, it is, I find it completely ridiculous when people take the bus to the gym and go on the cycling machine for an hour and then come back and ask them, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> but I do, I do also, I think it's really important that, we, we, that I, I disagree with you about moralising. I think it deserves to be moralised. I think a city with lots of cyclists is a nicer city than one with lots of cars because the air is cleaner, there you're less likely to get knocked down and it's just... You know, uh, to hell with it, cyclists are better. They, they deserve to win. <laughs> <laughs> I'd actually, I'm happy if, if there's going to be a war between sort of road users, and I don't think there is, then we deserve to win it. <laughs> <laughs> we, we haven't got the weaponry on our side. Right? No, we can no, say HGV. Armour that bikes up somehow. Right? <laughs> okay, so, um, so I'll bring uh, everybody else in again, um, but uh, yeah, strong views already. I know Jane, I know. So, Jane? Go ahead. So yeah, sorry. So I'll just I'll, I'll um, just explain. Yeah, uh, we'll come backwards and forwards. Maybe take one at a time, actually, given that we're short of time. Yeah, I mean, I am not a cycle lover, and I think your last point around yes, cyclists are much more virtuous, and this is a much better thing. This is the world I would like to see the city stopped and people uh, just riding bikes. I entirely 
disagree with, and I think that really is a problem. I, you know, I'm a person who's a very libertarian person, wouldn't want to ban something, anything. But sometimes when I'm working in London, I do think I'd like to ban cyclists. And where, say, things like the junction, you with Clockmill, Goswell Junction, it's not um, cars that are the problem. I can tell you it is cyclists, cars obey the rules of the road, and pedestrians obey the rules of the road. And when you're in London, the people who do not obey the rules of the road, and, and, it's, and it's very difficult then to negotiate that road because cyclists will just not do it. So um, I, I really hate virtuousness of, of, of the cyclists. Um, I do think cities are for fastness. The city of London is for cars, it is for fastness. I think the whole idea of oh, let's structurally change the city, I don't think that, I think that's a, an anti progressive idea, not a positive one. So just which rules do you mean are the cyclists? Which well, rules are the cyclists? Well, if you try and happen? happen, for example, a you know, junction across the yes, road, yes. so red light happens, and right. you know, green man happens, and the pedestrians know they can cross, and the cars know they should stop, yeah. and you walk across there, and you know, you're, the cyclist, you cannot judge what cyclists will do, and um, you know, so, so the rules break down, um, mm. you know, certainly in the, in the sense, certainly be aware of your uh, coffee I think, shop. I think most cyclists would agree that um, you shouldn't be jumping, mm -hmm. be crossing when pedestrians are crossing. So it's very hard. Yeah, I do. So, so what so I'll people do, do, but you know, everybody is different. I don't think it's a majority. Mm. So what I'll do actually, uh, there's a handful of questions, so I'll take them all, uh, if you could really be brief, and then we'll kind of do do the whole thing together, because otherwise, otherwise everybody, so if you could, maybe then, if you could be, I'll, Oh, so did you have a question as well? Oh, yeah. Okay, you might as well. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. But you yeah. had it because it's another motorist. Um, but we're looking for brief. brief cycling, no cycling, yeah. great. Cycling, marvellous. I love lovely. My, my kids cycles. I get all over South London. A couple of points. Uh, public space. You cannot have Copenhagen. And if you like Copenhagen, try Helsinki. White open space that I've never seen before, unless crushed. Um, we can't have the Copenhagen system without town planning. You've got to change the way that the roads and the town are You would have to raise London to make enough space for the amount of traffic, the amount of chill chain logistics that's going through town and in and out of the major systems. You, have, you really have to think how you know, you're going to use public space if you want cyclists and motorists at the same time. That's not going to happen. Other thing, it's a biggie, it's a real biggie. As a motorist, in the next coming few years, as far as I can judge by the media, I'm about to be accused, if I'm uh, damaged in some way or kill a cyclist or within, um, I will be accused, or I can quite easily be convicted of that. The fault will be entirely mine and not the cyclists. Um, that is a very, very major issue. It, it will happen in the next few years. There is mm -hmm. such a lot of pressure on the road. Um, risk wise, wonderful, so the health statistics would be amazing. I wonder how many drivers are uh, like myself with grey hair and my wrinkles, my God, you know, like my, my risk of having a stroke or a heart attack by having to avoid cyclists every day. Whereas <laughs> okay, is thank you. Three nice. very good questions, great. <laughs> uh, to just be honest, thank you. Right, I've had the experience of walking quite regularly in London, cycling quite regularly, and now learning to drive in London. And I really like the idea of the public space of the roads and being in the moment because I think when you're cycling, actually when you're driving, you've really got to be aware of other people. You've got to be in the moment with other people and aware of them. I just want to correct a little bit the idea that pedestrians are entirely innocent and everything. I've seen awful behaviour from drivers, awful behaviour from cyclists, and I've seen absolutely crazy behaviour and awful behaviour from pedestrians. The time that I almost got into a fight with somebody was when I was going down Tooley Street in the cycle lane. There was a jogger in the cycle lane coming the wrong way up the road in front of me. I said, can you get onto the path? Because there's a bus behind me here. He told me to F off. So this is about negotiating with each other. It's about society and how, how we are with each other. There ain't no winners in this. Let's, you know, work together. Great, thank you. Um, so there's a gentleman at the back there, then there's my son over here. No, I don't want to speak. Hmm? I don't want to speak. Oh, you had your hand up. This is what you had in On gas versus M, cyclist versus motorist, as we can see on this boat, uh, it's an absolutely ridiculous thing to be promoting. The cyclist should be saying the more people on bikes, the shorter it is. If you were cars clogging up the road, just going around the corner, um, and it it's a win-win. Everyone's aware. Not no one's aware. 
Uh, onto the helmet thing, which everyone seems rather sensible about, which is annoying because I wanted to actually <laughs> speak to someone who was really pro helmet. But it's actually health and safety by people who don't understand health and safety. Um, an actual risk assessment looks at the level of harm that can be caused by an incident and the probability of that incident. And if that overall level is too high, you reduce one or the other. Um, reducing it by personal protective equipment requires a level of personal protective equipment that will make a difference in a lot of cases. If you're going to legislate the cycle helmets, you need to legislate the cycle helmet helmets. And actually, if you want to be serious about them, have them regularly inspected and tested. Uh, if you, anyone think that's a sensible and proportionate response, um, they really need to learn that probability. Thank you very much. Okay, my son isn't going to speak for more than my wife is. I can do. But the thing is, though, is that uh, which doesn't come across from the panel, I'm not sure I'm having an argument with you, but with the kind of like, the Times campaign and all this kind of stuff. To me, if you're going to decide, if you make the choice to cycle rather than sit on a bus or a tube, that is your choice to do that, and you, with that is attendant risk. Mm -hmm. Now, risk of buses and the tubes are pretty safe unless you get bombed. And the, you know, the risk of cycling is the pleasure of it, I would suspect. I mean, having grown up riding a bike all the time, the worst part of riding a bike was the cycle proficiency test, where you have to learn the stupid thing that you never learn. And, you know, you're going on and off pavements, and all the, all the pleasure of cycling is going that bit too fast down a hill. Um, you know, kind of weaving past the bus when you probably shouldn't, but you get away with it. And all of those things, which you're making the calculation all the time, nobody else can make that calculation for you. And even if you sanitise the roads, which I think maybe London is just not suited to that. I mean, it is possible that there are cities where you can't do this. It's quite possible. We can't have everything. You know, there's all kinds of gains to, to, to London, living in London, and maybe riding a bike wherever you like, however you like, is not one of them. But, um, you know, there's a whole other way of cycling which isn't transport. It's my dad going out three times a week at the age of 74, which he's done for 50 years, out in the countryside. And, you know, anybody tries to tell him how to ride a bike, he'd tell him to F off, and which he as does, <laughs> with the police try and tell him not to ride in a pack uh, with someone who's training up cyclists to ride on the road. They, the police have tried to tell him, you shouldn't do that, you need to ride single file. And he says, no, this is a, I know what I'm doing, I've been doing it for 50 years. And that's what you need, is the experience. But you can only do that by getting experience. And you've just got to ride your bike, really, haven't you? And you can't protect and baby the people that are starting out. It you know, ruins it for everybody else. Don? Yeah, I just felt, I really enjoyed all the introductions, but I felt they were a little city and London centric, if I can make that accusation. Uh, as someone who cycles in northern Italy, in fact I cycled here this morning, that's why I was a few minutes late. Um, you know, uh, I felt, I felt, I agreed with a lot of the points about, you know, cycling shouldn't be moralised. Um, but I felt, for example, Josie's point that it should be uh, simply a model of the most efficient form of transport, when well, the countryside it's not the most efficient form of transport because obviously uh, it's much more efficient to drive. Um, so maybe even that's a little too restrictive to say that uh, instead of the moralisation of cycling that it should be, the model should be as it's just the most efficient form of, uh, of transport because obviously cycling is also about enjoying the view and lots of other things so may maybe we could even uh, talk about a freer form of it as well. However, I did like your point about cycle helmets and there should be a free choice. Uh, and I confess I cycle up hills and mountains without a cycle helmet because it's sweaty, as people say. And then I put a cycle helmet on when I'm coming down because basically it's as fast as a motorbike. And if I fall off, I would want a helmet on just as I would wear a helmet on a motorbike. You should get a motorbike helmet then because if you get a mass speed, it's not going to do a lot of good. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll have one for Christmas. Oh, now. <laughs> Hands up now. Sorry, guys. Um, I'm sorry, it's just that we've got just enough time for everybody to have a couple of minutes each. Apologies for that. Um, so, Matt, we got to you kind of last time. Any thought yeah. on anything you like? Uh, sorry, enough just, time for me to be restricted. Just, uh, it's good that there was a pause. I was just uh, I've been focusing on the. Shall I come back to you? Argument from the from the lady that seemed to suggest that. Right. Uh, it, you know, this conversation isn't really about whether uh, cycling should be allowed. Is it? But, uh, um, I think there was a good demonstration of the, the sort of lack of uh, understanding that the roads are for cyclists just as much as they are for cars, and that perhaps the shift in power is changing. And the car drivers are losing some of their uh, power and because there are more bikes and so cars are having to be more considerate. 
And uh, I think uh, cyclists that hit cars and get angry are angry because they've nearly been killed. But the, just to, because um, I've spoken to Jane about this before, so I know kind of um, where, where some of this is coming from. There's this kind of, um, let's have a few cycle lanes here and there and maybe, maybe let people, you know, I don't know, go ahead of the traffic lights a bit. There's kind of that. And then there's building a great big cycle lane across London and completely reorganising the city, uh, banning lorries. People have talked about lorries not being, uh, you know, Boris is full of these ideas. And I think that's kind of what Jane's getting at, is that can you reorganise it, and, and, and Jan, can you reorganise a city around cycling? And that's the kind of moral thing as well that was brought in to justify I that. think, as I, as I was saying earlier, I think my view really is that um, the roads should just be safer for cars and cycles to mm. uh, cohabit the road. And uh, I haven't been to Copenhagen, but there are ways. It's hard to imagine us getting there. Mm. Would you want to get there? Um, I'd, I'd rather see a world where the cars and cyclists were sharing the roads fairly, the accidents were yeah. minimised as much as possible. Great. Okay, okay thanks, mate. Uh, Josie, any final? Uh, no, I've been convinced by the, the people who argued that we don't need to organise London around cyclists. I mean, I think London is London. Um, I think that cyclists dominate in a city, can dominate in a city which is actually very small, so Oxford, Cambridge. Amsterdam, actually a very, very small centre, and I think that um, London is not like that. And it's most efficient within zone one, but if you were able to go to zone three, it's better to jump on a tube. So, um, so I mean, I think that, that in a way you have to kind of take, um, cyclists have to work out how to negotiate London as it is, and you can't be organised around that. I think there has to be a kind of democracy of road users, and so, like Amsterdam, cyclists will just completely go for it and possessions have it's their obligation to look out because the cyclists are the majority and so in a way the road gets its um, spirit and temper from them because they're the majority, majority but um, a different city would be different so I think there is a kind of democracy of road users which is quite legitimate um, that, that essentially you know it's mainly pedestrian so Oxford Street pedestrians just walk across without looking um, and that's kind of okay even when you get annoyed because it's it, 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 it is a pedestrian area basically mm. Um, so I think that there is a kind of box which is fair enough. However, I would really like to agree with Ed's point about public space, and I think that um, in that sense, I would actually call for a kind of flexibility of road rules. So I think that, I mean, maybe I'm just defending my fixed penalty notice, um, but sometimes it, it's fine to go through a red light, and, but you have to, it's your obligation to look out. And I think that there is a kind of intemperance that comes from everybody thinking they're within their rights. You know, so if if essentially there's one person crossing, you wait for them to cross and then you go, and it's, that's absolutely fine. Or if it's, if it's a right road feeding in or whatever, that's fine. But I think sometimes you, um, uh, you know, cyclists will drive, will go up pedestrians, ring their bells saying, it's a red light. And it's like, yeah, but you can't crash into them just because it's a red light, you still have to slow down. Um, and, you know, and, and, and the, the inverse, which is you're very careful going through a red light, which is, and, and people stop in the middle of the road and will try and block you and shout at you and say, it's a red light. And it's like, well, you know, if everyone's being careful, I think that, that essentially the problem is, 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 is bad behaviour. And I think that some of the conflicts come from people thinking, I am within my rights, these are the rules. Mm. And to that extent, I think that actually cycle lanes can make the problem worse. Because cyclists in cycle lanes do just kind of charge. Um, and I, I know the, the route around, and the streets around King's Cross, so everyone jumps off the, chain, the train and on the cycles. And, and, and it's really dangerous. Like people, mothers trying to walk their kids to school around there. And the cyclists just kind of go for it. And I think that cyclists, cycle lanes in a way, they reduce that negotiation between road users and they can be, make the cyclists just put their heads down and go for it. And they can just ring the bell if they see anyone where it's like, well actually, brakes would be good at this point, you know. So, um, so I think that I really, I really like Ed's idea of, of, of the road as, as negotiation. And, and to some extent, I think that means a flexibility of rules, such as pavements. I think actually such a pavement thing going at people is wrong, but sometimes it's not, it, it's fine. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, that, that that's one of the advantages of cycling is it's a little bit flexible. You wouldn't take a motorbike on pavement, but with a bike sometimes it's mm -hmm. fine. Um, and ditto red lights. Okay. So I'd say fewer rules and more negotiation. More negotiation. Okay. But Tom would obviously disagree because cyclists are. Oh, oh God. No, no, no. <laughs> no, anything you like on, on any comments. <coughs> no, a couple of minutes. I, I actually, funnily enough, I, I sort of think we shouldn't, I, 
I agree with you about red lights that it should be, but while it is illegal, we probably shouldn't do it. We should, I, I think that the red lights should be changed to change. We should behave, they should behave like stop signs for cyclists. You should be legally required to pull up to them, stop, check, and move on. At the moment, I try not to jump red lights, even at the time when it's obviously safe, just because it is actually illegal, and I you know, campaign for the law to change rather than break the law, I think. I want to speak to, I think it was, it was Jane, wasn't it, who said, City of London is for cars and it's for being fast. I was thinking, have you, have you, have you even been to London? <laughs> <laughs> it's not fast, it's not designed for cars, it's not for horses and carts in about the 16th century. It's all winding lanes. Car bikes are much more appropriate for getting around in these, in these streets than the car is. It's just, I, I, I hate driving in London, it's one of the worst experiences in the world. Um, that's all I have to say on that. Okay, great, thank you. Leslie, um, I should just plug your book, by the way. Leslie has written uh, Blossom, What Scotland Needs to Flourish, just down. Is it on the bookstore? I think so, yeah. Yeah, great. It may not be a stampede bill here. <laughs> um, well, uh, uh, one thing that interests me a lot is, is, is watching how people cross roads. And I think, although you know this could be wrong, that you can actually predict whether you've got someone from this country or a foreigner by the fact that they wait for the green person to appear. And what that suggests to me is that we're a grabby culture because our rules don't work. We're always grabbing moments to grab through the traffic because there won't be enough time to cross. Actually, grabbiness is pretty well endemic in a lot of what we do. We grab when we drive, we grab a moment where you might just sneak in front of this guy because actually we haven't got good systems. Now, it's not just cyclists who are doing this, we're all doing it. It's grabby, grabby, grabby. Um, unfair rules get broken. And what's happening with folk getting to the stage where they're at crossing red lights, you'd like to think slowly, but I, I'll, get, I'll give you. Um, I've seen folk, what really bugs me about cyclists is the lean might mean fighting machines who won't even acknowledge me <coughs> panting along as a fellow cyclist because I'm a different breed. You know, not only am I a different gender, but I'm kind of not sleek. Um, so that is a huge deterrent to people cycling. Um, but the ordinariness of it has to work, and to me, nonetheless, there is, it makes me weep, actually, to think how resistant there is, well, I've got to be blunt, how resistant you are um, becoming to structural change. This country, and by this I mean England, seems to think that you can just keep negotiating endlessly, perhaps voting different people in, and never looking at structure that underlies our lives. And after a while, it dictates individual behaviour. So if you want to leave this as a free-for-all, if you want to think London, and here we are in London, but there are more cities in this country than this one. And even London, I think, could do with a shake-up of thinking to the degree that stasis is not a natural state of life. Places can change and they can be transformed by the need to put cycles in because you would need to change the rail infrastructure. You would need to change many things if you were serious. And all those things might create more sense of community. They might transform the cities. So, you know, to me, there is quite a lot of good things that flow from thinking that we might want to just change the underlying things that, that create the behaviour that a lot of us are sick of, which is this grabbiness we all have and bikes might help. So Ed, is, is, a, is a negotiated public space necessarily a free-for-all or anything else you want to comment on? Yeah, just, just commenting on kind of the London-centric uh, point. I think Leslie did say some quite interesting things about cycling in Edinburgh and the rest of Scotland. So it's it's entirely, it's but uh, I, I think that there's something to be said for the debate being quite unique in London, and that, but, it, but it being broader elsewhere. If we could have more time, it would be nice to talk about what's going on in kind of the Suffolk and the home counties, with these middle-aged men in Lycra uh, steaming around these country roads. And that's quite an interesting debate to be had. In London, I think it's unique because there are so many, uh, so many, are you a member? Middle-aged men in Lycra. Uh, I never wear Lycra, no. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but I think there are unique features of like, the amount of cyclists there an interesting combination of people, of, of a lot of tourists and a lot of people that are trying to get from A to B, um, it being kind of an unhappy combination. Um, just in terms of um, there being people that don't respect each other on the road, right? And some people, some pedestrians, some drivers, some cyclists, and some joggers are shit, right? And they're not going to obey the rules of the road. And they, but like in any public space, be it a park, be it a square, you, th these need to be negotiated. And I think any regulation not only fails to do this, but it's often counterproductive. Because regulation often gives 
the illusion of an aegis, right? Like helmets, like most uh, perniciously, I think, these cycle superhighways give the illusion of um, you being absolutely immortal when you're in your, your, your blue strip of paint. And that's why this week there have been two inquests of cyclists that have been killed on cycle superhighways precisely because they believe that they have an entire right of way and a truck has come and steamed past them on the left. Um, so I think that attempting to regulate just gives the illusion that you are absolutely playing within the rules and you will be absolutely safe and even if you're not safe, um, that then you'll be, you'll be in the right if something does happen. So I, I don't think anyone has a, a moral absolute whether you're on a bike or on a car and so I think that any uh, legal developments to uh, attempt to make one group immune from responsibility is also highly counterproductive as well uh, and not to mention unjust. Uh, so, a lot, a lot to say, but I don't think that, that, that regulation is the answer here, I think it's counterproductive. So whilst it would be great if we were Copenhagen, I don't think there's anything we can do to, to, to force that from the top down. I think that any developments will really need to be, be a result of a cultural shift and, and, and not a, a policy. <coughs> thank you very much. Could you thank our panel? And thank you.